Hey, welcome to Church Experience Online. We're so happy you joined us today. As you're watching this teaching video, if you have any questions or need help getting connected, please feel free to contact us by phone or email. Also, our website is the best place to go to get access to helpful growth step resources. Join a serving team, connect in a life group, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially by giving online. At the end of this teaching video, you'll hear a Church Experience Worship original song. We hope this gives you time to worship and reflect on what you've just learned. Thanks again for joining Church Experience Online. Growth steps. I hope that each and every one of us over this season will take a step closer to God. That we will fall more in love with Jesus and become more like him as we live our lives for him. Well, there's a lot of different steps you can take to grow closer to God. And each week we're going to zero in on a unique step that you can take to help you grow. Each week we're going off-site to film the introduction to that week's message. So let's go ahead and jump in to week two of Growth Steps. There's something about water that's just so inspiring. I don't even know how to describe it, it just is. It's simply inspiring. You can be sitting at the beach looking out at the reflection of the sun in the water, or you can be sitting at a seaside restaurant just enjoying it. It doesn't really matter in what capacity you get to see it, it's just inspiring. And we don't like to just look at the water, we love to play in it. We love to swim, we love to boat or fish or paddleboard. People love just being in and around the water. We like to watch other people play in it. We like to watch the dolphins swim. Water is just amazing. And there's two things about water specifically that are incredible. One is it's a gift from God. It's free, it's, it's from Him. It's, it's something that He put in motion long before we were around, so it's not something that we earned. It's, it's a free gift from God. And also, we need to remember that not only is it a gift, but it's a great gift. It's vast. Water that God's given stretches all around the earth. It's amazing. And you know what? Water, in those two ways, reminds me of God's grace. It's a free gift to us. It's not something we earn. See, God's grace, His forgiveness, it's so full, it's so great, it's so amazing. It was put into motion long before you and I were born. God meant this gift for us. But not only did God want to give us this free gift of grace, it's an immense gift. It covers all our sins. God completely and fully forgives us when we ask Him. In fact, the Bible refers to water when it refers to God's forgiveness in Micah chapter 7, verse 19. It says, You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all of our iniquities into the depths of the sea. When God forgives us, it's like throwing our sins to the bottom of the ocean floor. He hurls our iniquities to the floor of the sea. God completely forgives. His grace is huge. It's amazing. It's vast, just like the ocean. And not only that, it's a free gift to us. It's this gift that we didn't earn, and we don't have to. You know, in Florida, we say there's two different kinds of water that we're around. And how you can tell the difference is by what you're looking out for. In salt water, you're looking out for sharks. In fresh water, you're looking out for gators. But there's actually another key difference between salt water and fresh water, right? Salt water, when you drink it, just makes you more thirsty. 
but fresh water when you drink it, it fills and satisfies your thirst. Jesus is referred to as the living water in the Bible. He refreshes us, he satisfies our thirst. And when we experience grace, when we experience God's amazing grace, he satisfies us, he fulfills us in every way. And what God wants more than anything in the world is for you to experience grace. Grace is the expression of God's perfect love for us imperfect people. And what's amazing about grace is it's the complete and, and full fulfillment of what God thinks about you. Grace is the fulfillment of God's expression toward you of love. He loved you so much that he gave you freely his grace, his forgiveness. Grace is something for all of us that, that we need, that we're in need of. You know, they say that if you cover your sins, God will expose them one day in judgment. But if you expose your sin, if you admit your need for sin and for grace, God covers your sins with his grace. See, God's grace is powerful and all of us need it. And today we're going to look at a story that's just saturated with grace. It's an amazing story, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. You know how you have like, you have stories that you really like and then you have some that you like love? I love this story. I think it's because I see us in it. I, I see all of us in it, and, and I think that's why God gave it to us. It's a story about two sons and a father, a father that loved his sons, and one of them that, that made some really poor decisions, but then in how it was all redeemed in the end, and, and I, I love this story, and it's in Luke 15, and I want to go ahead and just begin, if I can, just reading it to you. Luke 15, beginning in verse 11, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, and he set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. He wasted everything he'd been given. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. Now this might be his first time in his whole life that he was in need, that he felt what it, what it meant to be in need. He grew up in a privileged home. His father had provided for him everything that he needed. But now he's gone out and he's wasted all that he'd been given and he's actually in need. So he went and he hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his field to feed pigs. <laughs> He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. So this, this guy is so broken. He is so empty. He, he has so ruined his life that he's longing for what the pigs are eating. How many of you know that's a really bad day? I mean, if you want your pet's food, right? If you want the animal's food and you can't get any, that's when you know you've hit rock bottom. This guy, he, he longed for and wanted something and that desire, that drive in him caused him to chase it through wild living and wasteful living something. But it, after chasing something that would never fulfill him, he was left with nothing. In fact, it says he could not get anything. No one would give him anything. I mean, he, he, he found the end of himself. In your notes, I'd encourage you to write down this lesson. Sin will never quench our thirst. It can't. Sin will never quench your thirst. So you have this, this innate God-given thirst inside you, this, this desire for you that, that can only be fulfilled by God. And if you try to fulfill that through chasing the things of this world, you will end up spiritually bankrupt. And this son, he goes out trying to find satisfaction through his own plan, through his, his, his own travels his own purpose I'm gonna go out I'm gonna find and, and he goes out and he wastes everything that he's been given and he ends up with nothing see he bought into what this world will tell you will make you happy see the world will say you know you you just do what feels good you 
You go make yourself happy. Have you heard that one? Just do whatever makes you happy. That's, that's going to fulfill you. And in, the reality is, is that will not leave you happy in the end. That will leave you with a life of regret. That is a lie from the devil. It's not, you, don't, you don't live for, hey, this is just going to make me feel good. This is what it makes me happy. This is what I like. I'm going to do that. You chase that long enough, and in the end, you'll be empty. This guy, he, took, he had all these resources, and he went out with one objective. I'm going to go make myself happy. Where did that leave him? At the end of his journey, it left him empty. Now, he was actually financially bankrupt, but even if it doesn't ruin you in that way, it'll ruin you spiritually. If you chase whatever you feel like doing, whatever you want to do in the end, you'll be left ruined. This man found that out the hard way. You know, there's a lot of things that you can get excited about in life, a lot of things that you can pursue. Last week, I talked about National Donut Day, and a few of us were real excited about that, and I was illustrating a point, I talked about National Donut Day, and I think I just said something just casually, like, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we had, like, National Candy Day and National Chocolate Cake Day and Cookies and Ice Cream Day, and then later that day, I had a couple people start texting me these images. They're like, there actually is a National Chocolate Cake Day, and then they text me, there's actually a Frozen Yogurt Day. I'm like, I didn't even know that existed. And then, and then there's like everything. There's even a national hug your cat day. I'm like, are you kidding me? Like there's all these national days that people have made for random stuff. But you know what? There is a lot of different things that you can get excited about. There's a lot of things you can chase in life. There's a lot of things you can like, this is my thing. This is me. This is my identity. I'm gonna, but what will save you a lot of years is to realize that as a follower of Jesus, that our thing is grace. That's what we get excited about. That's the foundation. That's the floor. That's what we build on. And you can, you can add some of these other things into your life. But if, as we talked about last week, if you worship these lesser things, you will never experience the greater love that God wants to deliver into your life. And, and God has so much that he wants to pour in. There's so much that God wants to do in your life and how he wants to fill you with joy and peace and purpose. But you'll never find it if you're busy chasing the something of this world, the something that's going to make me happy. You won't be happy in the end. Now, you might, have to, you might be the kind of person, I'm going to have to go find that out for myself, and I hope you're not, because where you'll end years later or maybe at the end of your life is you'll end up where this man was, broken. Broken at least internally. He was broken externally as well, and he had nothing. And, and he got to the end of himself, and he realized my plan did not work. He goes out in wild and wasteful living. He's got a lot of money. He's like, I'm just going to go have fun. And it, he got to the end of that. And it's like he woke up on Saturday morning after a crazy Friday night. And it's like the party was fun, but I'm left with the hangover. And I'm left with a lot of regret. I don't even remember what I did. And it's like that will not get you where you want to go. And you can even wrap it in a nice package and call it success. And I'm going to chase these things. But, but if you chase something that's not fulfilling, you're left with nothing in the end. And, and Jesus is what we were designed to chase, his grace. It's what we need. And sin will never be able to quench your thirst. And this is so important for us to understand our core biblical beliefs when it comes to life, to understand truth, because it will save us a lot of pain, a lot of disappointment. Verse 12, his father, he's very generous. The younger son said to him, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. And he, and he, and he, gave, he gave this son half of his, what he had worked for, half of his inheritance went to this one son. He's very generous. Now, I cannot answer for you why God sometimes answers us and, or allows us to kind of run after, after things in life that we want and why sometimes he shuts the door and doesn't allow us. Because, see, it's, 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 it's a mystery to me. Sometimes God shuts the door. You're praying for something. You want something. You're chasing something, and he just makes it. That's not possible. Because he's being kind to you. He knows that that thing that you want would ruin you. And, and, and I, I just want this so bad, God. Please, God, give me this. And you're, you're fighting for it. You're, you're struggling for it. You're striving for it. And God knows if he gives it to you, it would ruin you. It couldn't even be something good. But if your character can't sustain it and he gives it to you, it could actually ruin you and mess you up. This young man, he was given a lot of wealth. And you know what? That's what money will do to you. It'll just accelerate who you are. If you're a generous person and you're given more, you'll, you'll, be, you'll have more to be generous with. If you're a really greedy person, you're giving more, you'll, you'll be greedy with that. You'll be stingy with that too. It's not like it changes the fact. It just accelerates, it, it exaggerates, it shows who you are on the inside. And, and, and so this guy, he was, he was given resources to chase what he wanted to. And in this case, for some reason, 
he was allowed to do it. And, and he took that money and he went out and his character came out and he went out in wild and wasteful living and he ruined himself through it. And so I don't know why sometimes God allows us to go after certain things and he just said, all right, and, and you're gonna have to learn the hard way and why sometimes he, but, but in his kindness, he, he knows what we need. And this young man, he needed to learn a lesson. See, he was growing up in the home as his father. He was getting older, he's physically maturing, but he had not matured in the interior parts of his life. And so he had to go learn some hard lessons, and he did. He learned it the hard way. He got to the end of himself, and he got to a place where he needed grace. He had ruined everything. Do you know that that God knew you were going to ruin what he created when he made you? He knew that you were going to ruin the paradise that he placed you in. Adam Adam and Eve were placed in this amazing garden. Adam and Eve were given paradise, and God said, enjoy. But before, before he release them into this beautiful paradise. Because he's God outside of time, he knew that they would run it. He knew that we would run it. That, that wars would mark and scar the landscape of this planet. He knew that there would be pain and violence and poverty. He knew that we would do that. But in his kindness and his grace, he still allowed us the opportunity to experience what he created. That's, that's part of his grace. But even though, he, even though he knew that we would create a problem, and, and that we would sin, and that our sin was great, he had grace for us that he knew he was going to deliver that was greater than our sin. And, and he had grace for you, even though he knew that you were gonna mess up. The Bible says we've all sinned and fallen short. He knew that you were gonna mess things up, but, but he already had grace planned for you in the form of Jesus so that you could experience his grace and forgiveness. He's that loving. You know, I, I experienced uh, grace in my life one time. It was so powerful, and, and uh, it, was, it was needed. I was in college, a roommate of mine, Mike, we were across town getting a sandwich between college classes. We were young guys, and, you know, not thinking probably real clearly at the moment as we walk out of the restaurant, and one guy says to another, I can't tell you which one of us challenged the other, but we were both all in. We're like, let's do this. We're like, hey, I'll race you back to campus. And well, when one guy, especially one young guy, college student, challenges another, you know, and the adrenaline gets pumping, some really bad decisions can be made in those moments. And you can kind of see what's going to happen here. We get out in the parking lot, we run for our cars, we get in the car, we turn the ignition, and we, we peel out of the parking lot. We, we are taking our cars out on this, this main drag. It's, it's uh, two lanes on each side, and we're flying down. There's a center middle lane, and we're, we're flying down, heading back to school. And, and we get up to a congested area by, by a stoplight. And my friend, he, he, my roommate, he goes around the traffic, he, and he kind of passes all these cars. I'm thinking, okay, I can't let him win. So, so I peel over into the right-hand turning lane. And I pass all the traffic, and I catch up with him. Well, we, we speed back to the, the college campus, you know. I, I don't remember who won, but we high-five each other, and we're walking into the, the class. We think, oh, man, that was cool. That was adrenaline was pumping. Again, poor decision now. I would never recommend someone racing somebody on the road. But, man, we, we made it there, and we walk into our class and finish our, our school for the day. And, and I leave and after class, and I go over to the, the church that I attended. And I was helping lead the, the high school youth ministry there. And I go and I sit down in the church offices at a desk. And uh, I'm not there more than a few minutes. And the pastor walks in. Now, the pastor is a really friendly guy. He's always smiling. He's a neat guy. He's a bigger guy. Walks, it, walks into my office. And he is not the friendly, nice, loving pastor that I've always known. He's like angry like his face is about to explode it's like red hot and I'm like what's going on I did it just he just came in and sat down a- across from me and he he's just mad he's giving me the death stare I'm like I don't know what's going on here but this is not good and he's just staring me down and and and, and he finally talks and he, and he says Brandon my wife and I were driving today down the main road I'm thinking, okay, where's this going? You know, why, 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 why are you so mad about, you know? And, 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 and he, he's like, and we were getting ready to turn into the right-hand turn lane. And, and he's like, you know how I used to be a police officer? I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, this car came flying past. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And he's like, so he's like, I decided because I used to be a police officer, I'm going to follow this person that almost crashed into us and just see who it is. Maybe I'll report him. And he's like, I followed this car all the way to this Christian college campus. 
And he's like, you wouldn't believe who got out of the car. Well, I know, I know who got out of the car. He's like, I saw you and his finger is pointing at me, and he's mad. I am thinking, I am done. He might kill me right now. He's big enough, he can do it with his bare hands. And he's just looking at me, and, and I was broken, man, because I knew, I knew what I did, and I was just that sinking feeling inside that you just messed up bad. And, and I just took my hat off, and I was like, man, I am so, so sorry. And I was genuine. I just... I felt bad. Like, I knew I messed up. And I didn't see it at the time. I was just having fun. But, like, now looking back on it for sure in that moment. But as soon as he said it, I'm like, I knew I messed up. And I just, I just came clean. I'm like, I am so sorry. I shouldn't have been driving like that. And you're right. That was, that was wrong. I, I'm really sorry. And he just sat there for a minute, you know. And, and it felt like 20 minutes, you know. But he just sat there. And he looked at me. And he goes, it's really good that you apologized and humbled yourself because I came in here to fire you. And that would have that would have changed probably my life. You know, like that was like one of my early ministry experiences and went on to do other things from that. And it's like, and, and, and he, did, he was like, I forgive you, but don't ever do that again. And he got up and he walked out and, and I just sat there for a long time, just sat in my chair like, wow. Like I just was given grace you know, and, and that marked me, man. And you know what? He never brought it up later. We worked together for quite some time. We stayed in touch until he passed away, and I'm f- friends with his son. He never, he never, like, hung that over my head. Remember that one time when you screwed up? <laughs> you know? You remember that time when I almost fired you? He never, never brought it up. I don't ever remember him bringing that up ever again. He was always had a great relationship. And, just never, and, I, and I didn't drive like that again. I didn't cut him off. I mean, I, I learned. And, and his grace, man, I'm telling you, it, it impacted me. It changed my life, and I needed it. I was a broken man sitting in that chair, knew I did something really wrong, and I was in the hot seat. Do you remember the last time you were the one in that, in that chair? In need of God's grace, you're like, man, I messed up. I messed up. And you know it. You know it more than anybody. You know how much you messed it up, and you feel bad inside, and, and you're confronted with it. Maybe it's from the consequences of your sin. Maybe it's because someone else brought it to your attention. Oh, man, that's not fun. But then when you experience grace... When you experience forgiveness, man, it marks you. It impacts you. And you know what? Since that time, I've had some moments where someone has wronged me. Multiple times where someone said something about me or to me or did something to me or whatever, and it it hurt. And you know what I wanted to do? I I I wanted to make it right. I wanted justice to be served. I, 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 didn't, I didn't think that was fair, what they said, what they did. I, 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 mean, I want to settle the score. I, but you know what? When I've, when I've extended grace, even though I felt like it wasn't deserved, I've seen every time it was powerful. Not just in the life of the person receiving grace, but in my life in giving it. When I was the one extending grace, I'm like, that, was, that changed me. That grew me up to release that. That freed me up. And see, grace, whether it's given or whether it's received, is powerful. It changes us. And and our faith is built on this this truth of grace, that that you and I were in need of God's grace, that we say, God, we have sinned, we've messed things up, God, man, we've ruined what you created, and I'm, God, I'm deeply and forever sorry, and and, and God, I'm, I'm acknowledging, confessing, admitting my sin. And then his grace floods your life. That's what our faith is. It's his grace forgives you and, and frees you and, and you're freed up to run and live life and, and not have to carry the guilt and the shame and the weight of that. It's like God takes it and, and he did it freely. At no cost to you, at a high cost to him, his son, but no cost to you and I. That's grace. And we need it. We need it every day. Author Jerry Bridges says, your worst days are never so bad that you're beyond the reach of God's grace. No matter what you do, you're never beyond the reach of it. But you're never so good that you're beyond the need of God's grace. See, we like the first part. I love that, like, no matter what I do or how bad I screw up, that God, his grace reaches out to me. But what we tend to forget is that no matter how good we think we are, we're not beyond the need of God's grace. It's not like you experience God's grace one time. You go on and you live a good life and you say, Jesus, just sprinkle some some blessing dust on my life as I, as I live and do whatever I want. And I go make myself happy. No, it's like we are always in need of God's grace. We're dependent upon it. And if you forget that you need God's grace, you're, you're in danger of doing what this, this young man did in this story in ruining your life. 
of taking whatever blessings the Father has allowed in your life, whatever good, maybe he's given you, man, you prayed and now he, he gave you a family, or he prayed and you got that job, or you got that blessing in your life, whatever, and you forget that it's because of God's grace, not because you're so good, and, and you forget you need that, and you go off and you can ruin and you can waste and, and destroy the good in your life because you forget that it's from God, not because you're so good. You had a role to play in it, but who gave you life and breath? Who made it possible? It was him. So we can never forget that we're in need of God's grace. But we tend to do that. And then when others wrong us, you know, this father had to be hurt. You know, his son took all that he had earned and he, he squandered it, he wasted it in wild living. We forget that not only are we in need of God's grace, but we're in need to extend that grace. And if we withhold it, and we are, we are, we are the ones that are, are putting ourselves in a position that we don't want to be in. Jesus said, forgive and you will be forgiven. In the same way that you've been forgiven, you forgive others. We're called to give and receive God's grace. Luke chapter 15, I want to look back at this story again, verse 17. So this man, he realizes he's in need of it like you and I, I hope, will always remember that we're in need of God's grace. And he says he came to his senses. He said, how many of my, fire, my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, I'm starving to death. Can't even get the animal's food. I will set out, here's my plan. I will set out and I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he puts together a plan. You know, I think a lot of times this is where, where we, we get in trouble and then it gets worse because we make our plan. I know what I'm gonna do. I'm, I'm gonna figure this out. I'm, I'm gonna make a plan. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna fix my problem. I'm gonna go take care of it. And instead of turning to God, we kind of make our own plans on how we're going to figure it out and how we're going to fix the problem. And it says he came to his senses. He wasn't thinking clearly. And we're not thinking clearly when we're lost in sin, when we're chasing things other than Jesus. And, and unfortunately, pain prevailed in his sin, and that's what caused him to, to make a change. His, his cravings that he had chased that had ruined him and now caused him to experience pain. And he came to his senses. And the best thing that you can do when you realize you're off track, when you've kind of drifted spiritually, when you got stuck, is, is to acknowledge it. God, I, I acknowledge my shortcomings. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, a familiar verse says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. You know, a lot of people in our world are being deceived. They're deceiving themselves. We, we forget that we need God's grace or we don't know that we need God's grace. I got this. I'm good. It's all good. But it's not all good. It's not going to end all good. We need God's grace. But it says if we confess our sins, if we, if we admit our sins, acknowledge them, he's faithful and just and will forgive us all of our sins. He will forgive us our sins. He'll purify us from all of our unrighteousness, complete forgiveness, full forgiveness. He unleashes and pours in grace, as vast as the ocean. He hurls our sins to the bottom of the ocean floor. That's, that's God's grace when we acknowledge it. But the problem is that, is that we, we, like the son, we get a plan together. He says, he says I'm going to go back to my, my father's house and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a servant. I'm going to work my way back into the father's favor. I think you and I do this all the time without realizing it. I think, I think you know what, I'm just going to be good enough. I'm going to make some good choices, go to church, I'm going to do the right things, and, and, then, and then I'm going to feel better about myself. I'm going to kind of be good with God. And that will kind of make up for whatever it is that I'm kind of trying to overshadow. But that's not how it works. Even if you follow God's law perfectly from this point on in your life, which is questionable that you could actually do that. But if you could do that, and if you did that, it wouldn't be enough. L listen, listen to the words of Romans chapter 3, verse 20. It says, therefore no one, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. This is why, you know, we look at some people who don't know Jesus and we're like, well, they're a really good person. They're about, they're about a really good cause. You know, they're they're feeding the poor, or they're doing this or that. They're, they're a good person. How could God send someone like that to hell? How could God, how could God, you know, look at someone like that? It's a good person, but that doesn't believe in God and judge that person. 
here's the answer to that. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight. It does not matter how good we can be. It's not good enough. It says no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. So Paul, as he's writing this, he's referring to the Old Testament. He's referring to the Old Testament law. And there's all these rituals and all these laws that they had to follow. And they would ritualistically and legalistically follow these, these laws. But you, you couldn't, you couldn't, no matter how hard you try, fulfill every law. I mean, God's clear. Everyone fell short. And so they'd make sacrifices and ask for God's forgiveness. But, but, but what Paul's saying here is that the law was not given to you so that you could fulfill it completely and earn a standing before God. That's, that's not even possible. God knew that wouldn't happen. But rather, the law was given to us to expose in us what fell short to expose our sin, to expose our shortcoming, that we weren't good enough, so that we would identify one thing. We need God's grace. We can't do it on our own. God, we need your unconditional love. We need your forgiveness. We need your grace. I can't do it on my own. And when we come to God and we admit our shortcomings, we admit our sin, we receive his grace when we acknowledge our sin. But you have to know what sin is. You have to know what short, your shortcoming is, and, and you have to acknowledge that to God. But this, well, I'm just going to do what makes me happy, and I'm just going to do whatever I want. I'm going to live however I want, and I'm just going to ignore what God says, or I'm going to, like a buffet, I'm going to take the parts I want, and I'm going to kind of live this way. And, you know, God says to, you know, to, to, to live this certain way and have this character, and I'm just going to, I'm not going to ignore that part. Or he says to, you know, and, and maybe chasing pleasure or sexuality, I'm going to kind of not do it God's way. I'm going to kind of do it my way, and I'm just going to kind of ignore God's thing, and I'm going to do what I want and think that God's going to overlook that. You know, whatever it might be that, that you would tend to kind of like, let's just kind of not worry about that part. God looks at those things, and, and you know what? He, he's, he's just. He's forgiven, but he's also just, so he can't, he can't look the other way. But grace is when we acknowledge God, I I, I did not live up to your standard, and I need your forgiveness. And he looks at us, and he expresses kindness, forgiveness, and grace. And you're going to see that here in this final part of this story, verse 20 of chapter 15. The son, he, he realizes his shortcomings. He comes to his senses. In verse 20, it says that he got up and he went to his father. He got up, and, and maybe that's what some of us need to do, is we need to just get up out of our, our sinful lifestyle. We need to get up out of whatever it is that we've been chasing that's not pleasing to God, and we need to make a change. And, and it says that he got up and he went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. And was, I love this part of the story. He was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Like, this is his son. Now, he could, have, he could have looked at him in disdain, the son that wasted everything that he had, he had worked for. But no, it says he ran to him. Verse 21, the son said to his father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. He asked for grace. Verse 22, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe. Put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. He doesn't treat him like a servant. He puts a robe on him and he puts a ring on him. He's, he's my son. He's a part of the family. And that fat calf we've been saving for a big party, kill it, slaughter it. Let's, let's eat. It's going to be a party. I mean, this is going to be awesome. We're going to celebrate. This son is home. This, this one who was lost is now found. And grace has been extended. And grace has been received. And you know what, that's how God looks at you when you turn to him, no matter how far away you get and how far away you wander, no matter how many times you get it wrong and how bad of a day or weekend or season that you've had, you come back to God and you acknowledge your sin and you say, God, I need your grace, and he gives it every time. If you sincerely come and you humble yourself and say, God, I need your grace, man, it's powerful. He gives it. And maybe that's why you're here today. Maybe it was on the calendar, maybe it was someone that invited you, but maybe God drew you in today because you needed to be reminded of your need for grace. Maybe you've forgotten and things have grown cold and now you're in danger of doing what this son did and ruining all the good in your life because you forgot how dependent you are on God. Maybe you're here because God drew you in because, man, you have not been living right and there's some things that, man, and it's just you need, you need God's grace. I don't know where you're at. God knows. You know. Maybe the person next to you doesn't even know, but you know. And that's all that matters. And God, you know what? He looks at you like that father. You're like, well, what's God going to think? And I don't know if God can forgive me. And I don't know. I've really messed things up this time. You just come. You just, all you got to do is humble yourself like the son. And you come back to the father. And what did he do? 
he, he extended grace. He ran to his son. He embraced him. He put a robe on him, a ring. I mean, he said, let's party. Like this son of mine that was lost is found. And that's what we get to do. As a church, we get to extend God's grace. And I hope that we will always be a grace-filled community. Because here's, here's the lesson in your notes. Good is not good enough. We, we need God's grace. We, we need his grace in our life. And that, that means not only do we need it, but it means people in our community need it. And they need to have a church to come to that they can walk in the doors and feel God's love and not his judgment. That they can walk through the doors and not have people looking at them regardless of, of how, they, how they're living or what they believe, whether they believe in this or that or not. And, and they could come in and they, they are loved on. And I love that about church experiences that when people come, we, we love people, we welcome people. And you could come in here and not even believe a thing about Jesus or the Bible or, or live in the lifestyle following Jesus. We're gonna show you that you matter to God and that we love you. We're not gonna change what we teach. We're not gonna water it down and we're gonna, we're gonna tolerate the fact that people come and don't believe what we believe. But we're gonna ask them to tolerate the fact that we're gonna teach God's unchanging word. But we're just, we're just gonna believe that, that as you get to experience God's grace and his unconditional love, it's gonna change you. And I think that, that that's why God brought you here so you could experience that grace today. Thanks for joining Church Experience Online. Please don't forget to check out our website to get more connected, learn more, get your questions answered, or support this movement financially. You're now gonna hear a Church Experience Worship original song. We hope this gives you time to worship and reflect on what you've just learned. strong.